Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. Throughout 2020, we looked at the history of multiple iconic arcade beat-em-ups featuring Marvel licenses. This would include Konami's X-Men arcade game, Capcom's Punisher title and Sega's Spider-Man. Today it is time to look at yet another arcade entry featuring Marvel comic book heroes when we look at Data East's Captain America and the Avengers, another Japanese produced experience featuring an all-American produced cast of characters. Captain America is an extremely important part of comic book history and upon his creation he would offend a chunk of the American public. Keeping this in mind today, we are going to go back through time and look at the creation of this character, along with the Avengers, then later look at how this transitioned into an arcade game. Speaking of the gaming portion of the video, the titles Arcade Fly at the time would promote the outing as a thrilling action adventure, but beyond the marketing hype, we will also look at what it really brought to the table. Let's discuss all of this and more as we analyse this novel chapter in both arcade and comic books history, as we look at the story of Captain America and the Avengers by Data East. Yeah! Today's story starts way back in 1913, with the birth of a boy in Rochester, New York, who would go on to be known as Joe Simon. Joe would grow up in a poor Jewish family in a first floor flat which doubled as his father's tailor shop. During Simon's school years he would become the art director for both his school newspaper and yearbook. Joe would bring this passion into his adult working life. Early in his career Joe would begin drawing comic strips for various newspapers and magazines. During this time Simon met Fox Feature Syndicate comic artist Jack Kirby, a fellow gentleman who grew up in a Jewish home setting. The two began consistently working together and by 1940 the pair worked at Martin Goodman's Timely Comics, the precursor to Marvel. It was that year that Joe made a sketch of a character in a costume, writing the name Super American at the bottom of the page, but quickly came to the realisation that the name of this character was terribly lame. Joe states that there were too many supers around. Captain America had a good sound to it. There weren't a lot of captains in comics, so it was as easy as that and Captain America was conceived. Timely Comics publisher Martin Goodman gave the new character the green light, allowing him to feature in his own comic. Simon did not believe that his regular creative partner, artist Jack Kirby, could handle the workload alone, so would hire a whole team to work on this new content. Al Lieberman would ink that first issue, which was lettered by Simon and Kirby's regular letterer Howard Ferguson. It is of note that the same year that Captain America was conceptualised, that the world was a more than horrible place, with war currently waging in Europe. Nazi Germany were invading multiple European countries, while nations such as Great Britain and the USSR would continue to try their best to defend the continent from their atrocities. Simon states that Captain America was a consciously political creation, as both him and Kirby were morally repulsed by Nazi Germany's actions, and felt that although the USA were not involved in the war yet, they felt the USA's entry would be inevitable. Now as history shows us, the USA were forced into action after the event that unfolded at Pearl Harbor, but prior to such events, America had been reluctant to stop the Nazi aggression. To put it simply, many of the American public were highly against getting involved with the realities of war and the brutality of trench warfare still fresh in citizens minds off of the back of the First World War and more importantly than that, the United States in 1939 was not the same military powerhouse that it is today and it was a considerable risk for the United States to participate in another worldwide conflict. Some believe that the advances of the German army in Europe proved that the United States should remain out of the conflict, as the German forces were seen as too strong for the USA to contend with. Taking all of this into account, the country stayed out of the conflict until they were attacked themselves. Prior to this, however, it did not mean that Joe Simon and others believed that the United States should join to support its allies, as the stop of the spread of fascism was desperately needed. Issue 1 of Captain America was a prime example of this belief, with a front cover amazingly depicting the new protagonist, 
punching Nazi leader Adolf Hitler in the face. The eye-catching artwork resulted in a smash hit, with the first issue shifting over 1 million copies. Typically, like many subjects covered on this channel, this comic book cover would still spark its fair share of outrage, with many strongly objecting to such imagery. There were many American citizens out there who were opposed to what Captain America stood for, resulting in Simon receiving a lot of threatening letters and hate mail from Americans who supported the Nazi march through Europe. Nazi sympathisers of the far right would even loiter outside Simon's office, eventually putting both him and Kirby under police protection, with even New York Mayor Fiorello Lagardia contacting the pair to give his support. Later that very same year, before the US's active involvement in the war, DC would release a Superman comic, with a front cover depicting Superman taking on Hitler as well. In fact, it is of note that few at the time knew that the creators of Superman, including scenarist Jerry Siegel and draftsman Joe Schuster, were also the children of Jewish immigrants. In regards to the commonalities between these themes, an exhibition at the Jewish Museum of Belgium in Brussels has been tracing the Jewish backgrounds of some of the US's best known superheroes, including Superman, Batman and of course Captain America himself which makes sense as to why these creators were making their voices heard against Nazism before much of the rest of America. Moving into the future, Captain America's popularity only increased after America joined the conflict themselves. Captain America would go on to face Nazis, the Japanese and other threats to wartime America and their allies. Stan Lee, the son of Romanian-born Jewish immigrant parents, would also contribute to the character in issue 3, in the filler text story Captain America Foils the Traitor's Revenge, which introduced the character's use of his shield as a returning throwing weapon. Captain America was so popular during the war, issues were outselling Time magazine. When the war was finally over, sadly Captain America's popularity would slowly wane, and as a result the comic would sadly be cancelled in 1950. This did not stop them trying to bring him back in 1953, when he appeared in Captain America Commie Smasher, but this attempted superhero revival was a commercial failure. In spite of this, by 1964, the character would finally see a grand return. Shortly prior to this, in September 1963, The Avengers Issue 1 was published, a comic featuring an assemblage of superheroes who each had an existing series to call their own. The roster in the beginning changed from issue to issue, with the captain himself joining the Avengers team in issue 4. Creatively, the issue even explained the character's absence from the comic book world, where it stated he had fallen from an experimental drone plane into the North Atlantic Ocean, where he spent decades frozen in a block of ice in a state of suspended animation. This triumphant return exposed the character to a new generation of readers, and a new run of success. During this time, Captain America was recast as a hero haunted by past memories and trying to adapt to 1960s society. Now, with the first portion of this video done and dusted, I hope you learnt more about this more than expected nuanced character. So, let's move on to talking about the 1991 Data East game that features both Captain America and the Avengers team. The Data East game features a plot consisting of a supervillain, the Red Skull, assembling a supervillain team to help him conquer the world. This causes the Avengers to assemble to stop his evil scheme. Like many classic arcade games from the early 90s, Captain America and the Avengers features four player cooperative play, as this was a fantastic way for arcade vendors to make good money, as cabinets like this one could make quadruple the money of a single player experience. This is one of the key reasons that there were so many games like this published in the arcades at the time. As you can see, the game allows players to fight as Captain America, Hawkeye, Iron Man and Vision, four heroes previously highlighted in Avengers comic book media. Action starts off depicting a crowd of civilians desperately running away from the area the group of heroes are heading towards, to instantly set the tone of the game. Brawls quickly unfold as players rage through the desolate streets as gamers take on various foes. A lot of carnage is illustrated, including the display of a burning police car, to further emphasise the anarchy at hand. This same scene is juxtaposed with artwork of the Avengers painted on the wall behind, to instantly instil gamers with a feeling of hope. Players soon arrive at a bank and the whirlwind bursts through the wall, escaping with bags of money. This leaves players to face off with the pairing of both Claw and the Living Laser, the first enemies in the game with health bars of their own, I guess making them sub-bosses. 
After dealing with them, players find the whirlwind laughing maniacally once more, who proceeds to summon more enemies for the Avengers to take down. Watching this gameplay, you will probably notice that the Avengers function differently. Captain America can throw his shield, Vision can shoot lasers, Hawkeye can shoot arrows, and Iron Man has an energy shield and predominantly uses melee attacks. When players face off against Whirlwind himself, he literally has the ability to hurt players by turning himself into a Whirlwind. Although being the game's first true boss, he does not put up a huge amount of fight. There are cutscenes between stages that continue to progress the story, and after witnessing the first one, players progress to rooftops among a nighttime cityscape. Something you may have noted through watching this video thus far is that this Data East game looks quite aesthetically different to other Marvel beat-em-ups, in that all sprites in the game are smaller and less detailed than in other arcade games featuring Marvel comic book heroes. The positive of this is at least it feels like there is more room to move around in. Wonder Man turns up and provides the players with flying hover bikes, leading to a section of play similar to that found in many of the auto-scrolling sections within the Turtles beat-em-ups, basically turning the game temporarily into a horizontal Japanese space shooter, featuring some great scrolling effects, particularly if you look down at the water below. It features enough layers to almost look 3D. Enemies eventually face off against what appears to be a sentinel, what the game labels as a giant robot. Upon defeating it, players head back to the desolate war-torn streets below to take on further robotic foe, until eventually facing off against the Grim Reaper, who has the excellent in-game quote of, You came here to die! The next stage begins aboard a completely battered warship, putting further emphasis on this game's dystopian setting. Atop here, players take on the Wizard before meeting Submariner, a terrible superhero who Sega made a playable character in their Spider-Man arcade beat-em-up for some reason. He tells players that enemies are in the sea, however when the characters descend to the depths below, it is just another flying shooter section, with little effort put into looking like the characters are swimming. Next, players must defeat another large enemy known as a Mech Taco, before they descend further into an undersea industrial area. This is where further beat em up action commences, before finally taking on the boss of the area, who is known as none other than Mandarin, who proves more challenging than some previous encounters. At the end of the fight, the Red Skull taunts the player on the big screen behind, before action moves to space. Aboard a space object, classic beat em up action continues, until eventually the Avengers get to face off with the Juggernaut, bitch who functions as a sub-boss within the stage. As the Rebellion continue to make their way through the Death Star, more and more enemies continue to appear who as usual can be defeated, resulting in the game displaying great comic book onomatopoeias such as Whoosh and Smash. Next in here, players get to face off against Ultron who has all sorts of energy attacks which he can utilise against our heroes. In the following stage, we have more shooty shooty goodness, as the Avengers fly through space shooting projectiles at all sorts of opponents and oncoming obstacles. The cartoony feel of all of this kind of reminds me a bit of Air Zonk. At the end of this section, players once again descend, shooting at the Red Skull's laser cannon, before finally getting to its base and taking it out completely. After busting through a large wall and dispatching a few more foe, the floor then changes, sending players down a slope. The Avengers are confronted by Crossbones, who informs them they fell for his trap. Players must then continue to take down enemies and avoid other dangerous obstacles such as moving buzzsaws. After dispatching of these and continuing to progress forward, a boss fight eventually takes place against Crossbones himself. However, upon defeating him, the stage is not quite over yet. After his defeat, the team are taunted by the Red Skull before following him up some stairs before finally facing off against him on a platform that is moving vertically upwards. Upon defeating this boss, he transforms into a giant mech known as Mech Skull, with the real Red Skull appearing concealed in a pod, informing the Avengers that they are stupid men who have fallen for yet another trap. Mech Skull has a varied range of attacks, including the ability to shoot lasers, fire bullets and much more, but upon defeating him, he falls onto the Red Skull pod, blowing the supervillain up and leading to the end of the game. The end scenes play out, and thanks to the Avengers' brave and valiant efforts, the Red Skull and his evil plan has been crushed, meaning the world could once again safely breathe. Reflecting back, while I do not feel this one is visually as impressive as the Marvel games developed by Capcom, Konami or Sega, 
I still feel that gameplay wise the game is decent enough. Particularly when we take into account that the game mixes a good amount of beat em up action with fun shooter sections, as here we get to play as superheroes fighting in the air. After all, is this not where superheroes are supposed to be fighting in the first place? Arguably making this game more relative to superhero tropes and the source material than any of the other beat em ups from the era. Interestingly, this Data East game would not remain an arcade exclusive and would end up being ported to other formats, with the Mega Drive version of the game arriving first, being converted by the pairing of Isco and Opera House. This home version of the game can be played up to two player, allowing a choice between all four of the Avengers from the arcade game. Aesthetically, the game looks fairly accurate, which is to be expected considering the original arcade iteration looks more rudimentary than many other arcade games from the time period. To be honest, I feel the entire game does a very good job of replicating the arcade action on weaker hardware. Sure, this version is only two player, the graphics may have been scaled back, and the action is slightly slower, but I feel this is an okay conversion for its time that includes every stage from the original. At a later date, the game will be licensed to Mindscape, who got real-time associates to port the game over to the Super Nintendo, Game Boy and Game Gear. But none of these versions are sadly as good as what can be found on Sega's 16-bit hardware, and are more in line in terms of quality with other Mindscape publications. You know, mediocre licensed rubbish. So, all in all, if you're going to play the game on a home console, you need to play the Mega Drive version. But obviously, the best option today is certainly just booting up the arcade game using MAME. This is 2021 after all. To summarise, I think that this arcade game lived up to the quality of Captain America and the Avengers brand. It is just a shame that they never placed Adolf Hitler as an enemy in the game we could punch in the face. Sadly, I cannot see him appearing in Marvel vs Capcom 4 anytime soon either. With all this said, this ladies and gentlemen was the history of Captain America and the Avengers and their arcade game by Data East. Let me know in the comment section down below what other big superhero games you would like me to spotlight on this channel in the future. I would be curious to hear some of your suggestions. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and check out my videos covering other Marvel beat em ups and ring that notification bell to ensure you never miss a video. I can work on these videos full time in part thanks to those who choose to back the channel on Patreon. And everyone who backs the channel for as little as just $5 a month or more receives an additional video every week. This week I uploaded a video on the top 10 Wii games you should all play before you die. Speaking of patrons, special thank yous go out to... Sebastian Velez, Carl Johnson, The Murder of Crows, Heo Paulo Lopez, Joseph Rasnick, Luke Samuel Denton, Ben Harradin, Corey I. Mar Sr., Capcom vs SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinch, Evan Border, Philip Mant, Cambo Rambo82, Azul Rakai, Keith Ferguson, Joaquin Varela, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, Adrian Light85, Alephia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Prince Azana, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinker, ECU Professor, Kid Anime, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Hermes Gonzalez, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Post DXL, Michael Hall, Wesley Sang He, Ben Dover, Langston Miller, New, Brian Barry, Sarah Powell, Vlaming Renee, Marin Liga, Chris Cool, TOG Driver, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, Jade McDonald, Dan Van Dammit, Adam Castin, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Paul Elliott, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Space Inside, Andrew Bazanski, Gunther Hendricks, and everybody else who chooses to back this channel. I would like to wish all of you and everybody else who watches this channel a happy new year and a prosperous 2021. Yeah, cheerio.